Sorry, I'm just going to make sure I'm recording. Okay, recording. There we go, again. Um, so, you know, I, I don't make, uh, I mean, this is kind of silly, but anyway, we don't, I don't have a uh, slide to tell you about how we treat iron deficiency, but uh, let's just talk a moment about it. What do you know about iron, uh, treating iron deficiency? What, what, what do you think we do for iron deficiency? Kind of the most general way. Anybody have any ideas or have ever had to? Yeah, you want to, Carly? You want to? Would you? Thank you. Carly, yeah. supplements, maybe. Yeah, okay, so iron supplements, right? Um, typically, anybody uh, you know have any idea what the chemical name would be of the most commonly prescribed variety? Anybody? Go ahead. Use your mic. Ferrosulfate? That is the most common ferrosulfate. Um, how would, okay, so let's talk about some of the, does anybody have any idea of um, negative side effects potentially to taking iron supplements? Anybody have any idea about that? Sure. Amanda, Amanda constipation. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, there's another variety, and there are, there are several other varieties, but there's one, there are one that is commonly seen in prenatal vitamins for, pe for you know, pregnant women because it's less associated with constipation. Anybody know what it is, what type? So it's ferrous fumarate, F-U-M-A, okay, uh, well, anyway. Do I need to spell that on a board? Ferrous, so F-E-R-R, -R, I'm going to so Ferris, O U S, right? Oh, that doesn't look quite right, but I think it is right. Thank you. <laughs> Funny how you look at the word. Yeah, we can use that. Um, so Ferris fumarate is a little bit easier on the GI tract. Um, especially high dose prenatal vitamin type of dosing, it's good. What can you do, what would you recommend to somebody to help them absorb the iron that's in um, supplements? And actually what, you know, if you think about it, it's inorganic iron, right? Do you know what the other type of iron that's more easily absorbable? I'll just tell you, inor inorganic iron is not very readily absorbable, right? What's the other type of iron? And I'm really pushing your advanced human. I'm not totally sure how much new man goes into this, so I'm kind of testing here. Anybody know what other type of iron might be really much more easily absorbed? Heme. Heme iron, right. So the inorganic non-heme is what we get in supplement, right? Heme iron is the kind that's associated with red meat, right? And, and meat, um, but really red meat is a great source of it. So, those non-heme iron supplements are not well um, absorbed. What would you tell somebody to help them better absorb the non-heme iron supplements? Anybody have any ideas? Well, okay, Carl, I'll get you again. Go ahead. Don't overconsume calcium. Don't overconsume calcium at the same time, right? Calcium, a lot of minerals inter interact. So, so that's an excellent one. How about you, Abby? Abby, right? Yeah. Yes, of course. Fogel's on. <laughs> yes, wow, you got one off. I'm working on it. It's a little bit slow. But it's yeah. a hard left thing. You said it right. Okay, so yeah, I'm Abby. Um, and so I would suggest to consume with vitamin C. Okay. So that helps to absorb iron and then um, also educate on the fact that if they um, were drinking orange juice that had calcium fortified, that that is actually not going to be very helpful. Okay. That has calcium in it. So. Okay. Excellent. Very good. Vitamin C source, right? You've heard this before. I know you have, right? Probably Renee taught you that, I bet you. So vitamin C helps reduce the inorganic, you know, the, the non-heme iron to a more absorbable form, right? If you've got orange juice with calcium, that's the calcium problem, probably not so great. The other tip is if people actually, if you eat meat, okay, if, you're, if, if the person eats meat, it's a very useful thing to take the supplement with the source of heme iron, because heme solubilizes that iron. 
So all of the, this will be on the exam plan. Sure. So any questions about that? Iron supplements, take it with a source of vitamin C. Um, if you think about, well, let me just recap first. Avoid taking it with calcium at the same time and taking it with a source of heme iron, like beef, can be very useful. The other thing that tends to be recommended that I didn't say is that we might divide the doses throughout the day and just optimize absorption that way. Unless the person really is gonna forget and can't do it, you know, like my daughter, for example. She <laughs> does not like taking supplements. Nobody likes taking supplements, but. So with her, I'm just kind of, I give her the call, take it now, <laughs> you know, try to remind her. Um, okay, any questions about that? Mostly, got that? All right. Now, let's talk about, so iron deficiency anemia, by the way, oh, I'm not gonna go back, but just iron deficiency anemia, we said was microcytic, right, small cells, and hypochromic, so microcytic, hypochromic, low color, that's classic, you know, uh, how we describe iron deficiency anemia. And it's characterized by, um, if you had to say what's happening to the hemoglobin, hematocrit, and MCV, mean corpuscular volume. What would you, what do you remember about that for, with iron deficiency? Wanna, anybody off the top remember that? MCV, high or low? Low, right? Because the cells are small. I mean, the, the red blood cells are microcytic, so it's small. So folate deficiency anemia is a megaloblastic, a macrocytic, actually, macrocytic, right? So larger than normal cells. And um, really, the, the, the fact is that it's DNA synthesis that is impaired by the lack of folate. So it leads to large immature red blood cells. And characteristic uh, low H and H, in this case, high MCV. And if it's folate uh, deficiency, you could see a low serum folate. The serum values for iron, folate, B12 can be a little bit variable. Um, so there are ways that we, we can do a little more testing to kind of get at um, some of the, uh, to differentiate cause. But for our purposes, when I'm gonna put you, I'll give you a little scenario on the um, exam. I want you to recognize, I'll give you the normal ranges and I'll give you a value for, um, well, H and H, right? I mean, both will be low. They're always low in any type of anemia. Hemoglobin and hematocrit are always low in, in those situations. Um, and then I'll give you an MCV and I'll give you the normal range. So if it's below the normal range, you're gonna have to think, okay, it's microcytic. It's gonna probably be iron. You know, of course, there are more diagnostics. This is just kind of the sim simple approach we'll, we'll take. And I'll give you some other labs that'll go along with it. I'm not gonna likely give you some complex mixed anemia, <laughs> okay? I mean, that's very hard for advanced clinicians to figure out, right? So it's, it's just so you can kind of recognize. Um, and similarly, if I gave you a high MCV, you would have to say folate or B12, okay? Because folate and B12 deficiency both lead to that megaloblastic, macrocytic type of anemia. Now, um, sorry, I am not caught up in my notes, so let me just catch here and just, um, have you heard of the term pernicious anemia? You heard that term before? Anybody have any clue what that would be or why, you know? Why is it here under B12 deficiency anemia? Do you have any, anything you can re recollect or you wanna, maybe when I say it, you'll remember. You wanna say, Melissa? Go ahead. Um, it doesn't have to do with intrinsic factors it not being made anymore? It does, absolutely. So it's a problem. We'll, we'll leave it general. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you um, some things about that. Intrinsic factor is defective or deficient. An intrinsic factor, hmm, anybody remember anything about, have you ever been talking much about B12? Or Melissa, maybe I may have to hit, you know, have you, um, you have any idea what intrinsic factor does with B12? Yeah, please. Yeah, 
Um, don't you need it to absorb B12? Yeah, you do. Fantastic. Okay, so we're going to talk about that because when we get to GI disease, there are all sorts of interesting things that can happen with B12 absorption. Okay, so hold that thought. Um, the one thing up here that I, and I'm not going to tell you to explain this, I'm not going to ask you to do that, but shillings, a shilling test is how we differentiate, we discern whether there's an intrinsic factor involved in the B12 deficiency. That's how we diagnose pernicious anemia. And so again, to be very clear, pernicious anemia is B12 anemia, macrocytic you know, anemia caused by B12 deficiency that is very much a two, uh, uh, because of a problem with intrinsic factor. That's the specific thing that, that's driving it. Um, so the Schilling test is, you know, you give radio-labeled B12 and unlabeled B12, and it just, it's a very complex test. So I might put this on as a just, you know, something like, oh, I don't know, I, next week I'm going to talk a little bit more about the exam, but I might say something like, you know, I might list this as if it were, you know, like if you were having a screening uh, uh, assessment tool, you know, think about what we do when we do nutrition screening and, and you know, Chilling test would certainly not be on the data for a nutrition screen, right? It's a totally complex, very much a special order type of test, right? Um, so just, yeah, I'm not going to ask you to explain it um, per se, or at all, actually. So let's talk about this down here. So B12 deficiency is most commonly an issue of malabsorption. What it, what, um, so I'll just, because I've kind of got it here. Hypochlorhydria and gastric atrophy in older adults, um, common, about, I don't know, 30% or so people in their 70s and older tend to have some degree of hypochlorhydria. So if this is a stomach problem, what do you think that means, hypochlorhydria? What would you guess? If you had to take a guess at the and you're reading the chart, and you're in your internship or whatever, and you're saying, oh my gosh, what the heck is that? Okay. Anybody? Wild guess? Yeah, cold. Uh, low stomach acid production? Yeah. Decreased HCL production. Thank you. And so yeah, that's what that means. Gastric atrophy, the, 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 I think it's the parietal cells. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask you what type of cells, but they, you know, there's some diminished functionality that happens, and just a little bit less acid gets produced, and that can potentially contribute to malabsorption of B12. Problems with the ileum or pancreas can also interfere with absorption, and we're going to go into that with some detail. Um, I'm going to skip this because this writes, it, it's, I've walked you through in you know, extreme detail my very exciting animation that comes after these two slides. So these two slides are for you to go back and revisit my, just brace yourself, buckle up, we're going for a very exciting animation now. So you know, <laughs> it's PowerPoint drawing, oh, it's so exciting. Um, yeah, I was so proud of myself when I did this, my first professorial job. I was teaching metabolism and vitamins and minerals. Okay, it's not that exciting, so let's just start at the beginning, okay? Um, and I don't know if you've had this before. I don't think so. I don't think anyone really has taught you about absorption of B12, or am I? Okay, thank you for corroborating that. So, we eat. This is supposed to be, you know, at the top of the stomach. We'll imagine the esophagus up here in the mouth, right? So, we're eating food. Um, that contains vitamin B12, right? Vitamin B12 is bound to protein foods. It's off, it's, it's in animal foods, right, mostly. Or, yeah, pretty much, well, not completely, but mostly. So, you've got protein-bound dietary vitamin B12, right, comes in, we hit the stomach. If, if you blink, you'll miss it. It's very exciting animation here. So, parietal cells are producing that HCL and intrinsic factor, right? So the parietal cells um, both produce, uh, produce both HCL and intrinsic factor. Now, what happens next is pepsin gets activated by the HCL, right? 
this is where basic physiology and advanced human come together with MNT. Um, that breaks apart the protein from the B12, so you, now you've got free vitamin B12. Well, that would get degraded if it, if it didn't do, so, if, if something didn't pick it up and chaperone it, okay? And that's the R proteins. So R proteins are chaperones, they bind the B12, keep it from breaking down. And now we've got R protein B12 somewhere in this stomach, moves down the track goes into the duodenum. At the same time, the intrinsic factor that was produced by the parietal cells, it moves down as well. So now we're in this, you know, the duodenum. <laughs> intrinsic factor is going to keep going. When you hit the duodenum, the higher pH activates trypsin, right? We're going to talk about that again, we'll get pancreas and all that. Um, but the trypsin is important because that breaks apart the R proteins from the B12. And now the B12, gets a ride with intrinsic factor. So it makes a complex. Intrinsic factor of B12 makes this complex. It moves down now, and this is obviously not to scale, obviously. And we get to the very end of the small intestine, to the ileum, where we have very specific receptors for that intrinsic factor B12 complex. And the intrinsic factor B12 complex binds to the receptor, gets taken into the enterocytes, the B12 gets absorbed, the intrinsic factor gets released. And that's the end of this exciting image. Are there any questions about B12 absorption and how it works? Any part that I need to go over again? Yeah. Sure. I have a question. Um, yeah. If somebody's on a lot of antacids, does that affect B12 absorption? Yeah. Um, in, in short, likely, yes. Um, it's not, uh, it's interesting, so it's, it's a complex, uh, you, you, I think it can. Uh, why do I say it that way? Because I have seen some recent papers that have looked at proton pump inhibitor use, and B12 tends to not be as big of a problem with people with proton pump, proton pump inhibitors as you would to it, you know, you would think it would. And I've just had somebody share that with me recently, and I'm not totally sure how. We're not seeing people widely experiencing megaloblastic anemia that are on proton pump inhibitors. But if you have an older adult, I mean, there's always the chance because you've got, dec you know, you've got decreased HCL, decreased intrinsic factor production. Um, incidentally, by the way, you know, a moment ago I said hypochlorhydria as one of the characteristics of gastric atrophy that happens with, with aging or older, older adults. Um, you also, if you think about that, gastric atrophy, not only acid, but intrinsic factor production can also be impaired, right? I mean, it's the same uh, potential cells that are being impacted. So um, you could see intrinsic factor go down as a result of that as well. Um, the last part of this is things to think about. And when we get to GI disease, we're going to talk more about it. Um, so I, I will go quickly through this, but th this is written out in excruciating detail, so I'm not going to, I don't think I would like, I, I really don't want to just read it to you. Um, so I'm explaining how, if you have a problem with the stomach, how that could happen, that, that uh, how it could lead to vitamin B12 deficiency. So I really want you to start learning this now. Um, for this exam, I, I'm pretty sure I've got a question or two around this and you're going to get it again in GI because it's so it's it just it's interesting but it's also you know there are lots of parts that could be affected you could either have your stomach out completely removed total gastrectomy or a partial gastrectomy or you can have that gastric atrophy that I mentioned right where you get hypochlorhydria and diminished intrinsic factor and I want you to be able to explain it so if a patient has that you know you can explain it you can have problems with your pancreas. So here's where you really are pulling together all of the stuff you've learned in physiology and advanced human and probably principles, maybe to some degree. You learned about digestion, absorption, all that stuff, right? So pancreas, if that's impacted, it's going to impact the trypsin, right? And, and I want you to be able to explain, OK, so if pancreas is not working well, trypsin production is going to be down. You're not going to be able to separate the R protein from the B12, right? So it sounds over the top detail, but it's 
it's something that I just think is um, useful to be able to explain and understand. Terminal ileum could be inflamed or it could be removed. Um, we've got the B12 caused by lack of intrinsic factor, and in that case, it's called pernicious anemia. Um, ah, and then, okay, so that's all mechanism, and I've written it out for you. I want you to go back and look at that. Are there any questions about any of that before I move on to talking a little bit about symptoms? And Okay, so the thing about B12 deficiency is that it is caused, the, the megaloblastic anemia, or macrocytic anemia, is caused by a secondary folate deficiency. And that's because folate metabolism, um, I mean, B12 metabolism requires folate, or vice versa. Let me just think about how I'm saying that. Um, yeah, I've got it there. I'm, I'm going to say it wrong. B12 is essential for folate metabolism. So if you don't have B12, you are impairing your ability to make DNA, essentially. So you can't make those big, you know, those red blood cells. They end up large and immature. They can't get the DNA they need, essentially. So that's all very, it's overlap. You, if you've got a megaloblastic anemia, you have no idea if it's folate or B12. But, so that's why we do more diagnostic testing or we just, I'll, I'll, I'll say what our, our, our solution is in a moment. Um, the really heinous thing about B12 deficiency is that it, all, it, in addition to the megaloblastic anemia that's because of the tying up the folate, right, or, or, or comparing folate, is you get neurologic impairment. You can get brain damage as a result of B12 deficiency. So it's something that we don't want to have happen, <laughs> right? Of course, um, really, you know, that is, that's a big deal. So what I ask you here, and I answer it, so I'm gonna just, I'm just going to say that I want, I'm gonna, I want you to be able to know or to be able to explain why it's not a good idea to just inadver you know, um, indiscriminately give a bunch of folate to somebody who's got megaloblastic anemia, right? If you don't know the cause of that, when you give a lot of folate to someone, and this was something that was one of the arguments that came up by the, um, uh, what's it called, the, um, the, um, Dietary guidelines, the thing that Joanne was on. It's the dietary guidelines. Yeah, yeah it came up. Because when we started talking about supplementing all our foods or a lot of our foods with folate to prevent neural tube defects, this came up. Like what if we swap, you know, out people with folate and we have older people that may be, you know, having dementia and we won't know because we've treated the megaloblastic anemia by giving folate, right? You cure the anemia, and that's the major symptom, really, in an older adult. If you're, you take a complete blood count and check them out, they've got anemia. If they don't have anemia because we've given them so much folate, you could see where that's a major issue. Can you see that? They've got brain damage potentially contributing to their dementia, and, and that, you know, it's untreated. So you don't want to discriminately give folate. Um, what typically happens, because we, could, we do to have diagnostic tests, right? We can, we can differentiate between folate and B12, um, and that will be in your standard you know, nutrition textbook if you go look. Um, it's so cheap to give both folate and vitamin B12 um, that typically if somebody's got megaloblastic anemia, a macrocytic anemia, we're going to supplement both. We'll give vitamin B12 and folate. There are certain populations, if they've got GI disease that's driving that B12, we're gonna give B12 shots, intramuscular shots, we can do sublingual, we can do other ways that will bypass the absorption issue. Um, and so you can, essentially that's what we do. And, and it's, it's a very cheap um, fix. Everyone understand why that's so important? And um, any questions about that? Okay. We started to talk about hydration last time, so let me just finish out the discussion and, and revisit. So remember, we, we calculated serum osmolality for MB. Uh, we're going to get back to MB in just a moment. And I told you that in the, you know, this is sort of MA, MNT world a little bit, calculating serum osmolality. You can actually um, measure a urine osmolality, which is a much better indicator of hydration status, so it's extremely expensive. 
right? So we don't do that as a standard. But if you were ever, if it was critical that you, you know, needed to assess someone and you had no other tools in your toolkit, which is unusual, right? Um, urine osmolality would be a much better indicator. But in our world, this is just a way for us to sort of think about the labs that potentially contribute um, or, or get affected by um, hydration status. And so I, I mentioned sodium, right? Hypernatremia um, can be because you are low in your blood volume. And if you think about it, when we say these emia, right, at the end, anything with emia, it means in the blood compartment, right, the blood vessels. You can be fluid overloaded. It could be elsewhere. You could have edema and maybe not in your blood vessels. And then, you know, you, you might get confused by what the serum sodium is telling you. So it's not an easy picture. This is very simplistic for us to start talking about it. Similarly, hyponatremia, right? If you're overloaded, you've got lots of water in your blood vessels, excess fluid. You may be getting a lot of fluid volume, um, potentially. That'll be impacted. Um, remember I said BUN to creatinine ratio above 20 would indicate or suggest, again, I'm going to say suggest a lot because it's a complex picture and you don't ever, you know, you never hang your hat on one piece of evidence ever. Um, but it could suggest dehydration to have below, I mean, above 20. All right. So next slide, you know, serum osmolality, normal. We're going to get back to this when we talk about tube feeding formulas, because we're going to use this as a rough guide to what we call isotonic formulas, which would be not more hype, not um, different from blood in terms of the osmolality. Um, and it, it, it'll, it's slightly different when we get there, but I'll, I'll, I'll point back to it. Um, and this is really using other information to corroborate your, your this estimate, right? So I would give you many things in a case that will give you clues and they all will come together. So I'll ask you, what, what about this case would suggest that the patient is dehydrated? And you might see, okay, serum osmolality is high. So again, remember what it is. Don't memorize, okay? But just know that um, if I give you the normal range and I say the, the value is 300 or 350 or whatever, you know, okay, that's high. That means it's more concentrated, right? So less fluid. So just reason it out. Don't, don't memorize these things. And then last, I think, on this, there are a few other labs that can suggest hydration changes. So hematocrit is the percent of the blood volume that is red blood cells. You think about that. I don't know. Um, I, I, I'm not sure if I had that previously. So it's the percentage of the blood volume that is red blood cells, that's the hematocrit. So if you have um, blood volume goes down because you're dehydrated, you could imagine that the hematocrit's gonna go up, right, and vice versa. So uh, if you, you know, you've got just a hematocrit that's low, but the hemoglobin's normal, hemoglobin is the protein in the red blood cells themselves when we measure that, right? So then you would say, oh, it's not anemia, it could be that it's, a hydration problem, right? Does that make sense? So, and then urine osmolality, again, high indicative of dehydration. The other one is urine specific gravity, another test that can be done on the urine sample um, that can indicate. I'm not going to ask you to remember these um, values. I'll, I'll give you the value, the normal range for these things, and I'll, you know, you can decide. If it's below normal, it's low, right? I mean, that's easy enough. We talked about water. Fluid loss or gain, more than a half pound loss or gain over 24 hours suggests fluid change. We talked earlier about fluid intake and output records, right? INOs for nurse, from nursing um, charts, electronic record. Very useful for us to think about when we're trying to corroborate and try to get a, a handle on fluid um, status. And then you can have uh, you're going to look at hematocrit potentially, sodium, albumin, serum osmolality. If you want to, again, for MNT world, we're going to calculate that so that you can get an idea. And it would all come together in the same sort of uh, direction for us to know biochemically what we're talking about. Um, oh.
I got ahead of myself. I'm sorry. I totally, <laughs> excuse me. I clicked and I was looking at the, the next line. So these are the clinical signs. I want you to know these, okay? Um, so dehydration, blood pressure drop, low blood pressure, poor skin turgor. Do you know what that means? Can you imagine what that is? Yeah, skin turgor, where if you are, you know, you pinch, if you pinch, and Britta Brown is going to come on the 17th after our exam. We're going to talk about nutrition for the exam. And um, if you're, you know, like me, because I've got really dry skin, it, you know, I'm, I've got a poor skin for a very moment, and I'm dehydrated, but I'm not drinking a lot today, um, apparently. But that's how you would do it. So poor skin turgor. You can see penting is what we call it when you, you know, you do that and it stays. Actually, I'm okay. Um, really dehydrated, it's going to stay. And then um, elevated body temp, dry parched lip, dry conjunctiva, increased heart rate. What's the medical term for increased heart rate? Somebody grab a mic. I bet you know it. Please, Sarah. Tachycardia? Yes. Do I need to spell that? Tachycardia. T A C H. Why tacky? Anybody know the opposite, which would happen with overhydration? What is the opposite of tachycardia? Abby, can you use your? Bradycardia. Bradycardia, and that's B R A D as in dog. Y bradycardia is slow, and that's a sign of potentially overhydration. High blood pressure for sure for um, overhydration. So they're, they're opposites, okay? Pretty, not totally, but mostly. Um, does any, um, oh, orthopnea. Anybody have any idea what orthopnea, orthopnea is? No guess? Um, no, no, yes. Jesse, right? Jesse and something to do with the mouth? No, but a fantastic guess. I mean, it's pretty far off, but <laughs> I appreciate you guessing. <laughs> okay, let's do this. Pnea. <laughs> what would dyspnea mean? breathing yes so orthopnea is something about breathing and it's a weird one really because it doesn't include the word this so actually why would you know let me just tell you what it is oh you know Kristen go I ahead googled it, so oh, I, oh okay well you know what that's okay what is it how does it how did they define it on Google the ultimate resource <laughs> shortness of breath when lying flat yes okay so I want you to imagine, if you will, why if you were overhydrated and, you know, if somebody has, let's just say, when you've got edema that is around your lungs, pulmonary edema, or you've got just overhydration in general, it tends to lead to going elsewhere, right? So it's not like we control where the edema is. I mean, sometimes it's just in your ankles, right? Um, but often, if you've got big edema, we call that anasarca, generalized everywhere. I'm going to spell that soon, I think. I can't remember where it comes up. Maybe I should spell that out. <laughs> um, it's going to move around your lungs, right? So if you imagine lying flat, and um, so anasarca, we talk a lot more about um, edema. I can't remember when. I think. Can you see that, guys? It's A N A S A R C A, anasarca. That means big generalized edema everywhere, massive edema. 
And if you have that, water is going to move, right? It moves into the interstitial spaces. It happens to go around your lungs, around your heart, around your gut. You know, everything dysfunct is dysfunctional when that happens. So if you've got pulmonary edema, and if you looked, um, you know, we've got a pulmonary module that talks a little about this too. Um, when we talk about heart failure, patients like that are going to also have work apnea. So if they lay down, they're not able to breathe because that fluid is going to move and it moves around the lungs and it's preventing you from breathing very well. There's pressure that that, that fluid puts on your lungs and they're trying to expand and they're not able to do it when they lay down. So. I'm getting off like I always do. I tell you, we're just going to keep being really slow, Katie. Um, when we talk about pulmonary and heart, especially heart failure, and that's next term, you talk about this really cool term. I think it's an interesting one. So it's, we, we describe orthopnea as three pillow, one pillow, two pillow, three pillow orthopnea. Can you imagine that for a moment? What would three pillow orthopnea be? Would that be worse or better than one pillow or apnea? It's worse. It means you need three pillows behind you to breathe. So you really are pretty much sitting upright, 90 degree. Okay? So anyway, that's just a little trivia. Hopefully it will help you remember. Um, anything else? Distended neck veins, short-term weight gain, of course. And those labs, right? I mean, I think that was self-explanatory. Um, Terminology, just that's sort of kind of common. Basic metabolic panel is a, a, a panel. Many hospitals use this terminology. It, it, it's basically when you're wanting to check electrolytes, um, glucose, BUN and creatinine, typically those are, um, when we talk about starting nutrition support, I'm gonna, we're gonna be thinking about checking electrolytes before and during the progression of nutrition support. A BMP would be the thing that we would probably order to just check that, it's, these are standard priced things. And then a CMP is comprehensive, typically will include some of the liver function enzymes. We'll talk more about that when we get to liver, and it includes the electrolytes, and you'll see serum albumin as well, and some other things like that. And that's it. Additional labs ordered separately. That, you know, of course, we can order any other um, labs. Um, in the module, Two, I think it was, we talked about, wasn't it two where we talked about repeating syndrome? I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. If you had that, you would add magnesium and phosphorus because you can see that it's not part of the standard electrolytes typically. Magnesium and phosphorus and potassium are all the three really important electrolytes that we're going to be thinking about um, when we're thinking about the risk for refeeding and um, we'll talk more about that. But, so you could order this. Any questions about biochemistry before we um, move on? Okay. I'm going to let you go back to the summary in, in a moment here, or on your own. Okay, so what I'd like you to do now is let's get back to MB. Um, we had just done questions one and two. So remember MB is on the website. Um, if you had downloaded the doc, you've got hopefully the doc that you're, you're typing into. Um, and we had decided she is euhydrated, right? She's not dehydrated or overhydrated. She's was something like 288 was her serum osmolality, right? So what I would like you to do now, and I'm gonna, I'll put up a, um, a slide that potentially will help you with this, but module one, uh, two, sorry, in module two, I ask you for question number three in MB, pull that up. It says calculate predicted RMR by the mifflin saint Jor equation. And I say evaluate her metabolic status, okay? So I want you to pull up module two, find the mifflin saint Jor equation, and I want you to look at um, that module tells you how you evaluate metabolic status. And um, I'm going to have you work on it a little, and then I'll, I'll explain a little more about that after we do a little bit, OK? And I'll find where. So 
So here is the slide. Go ahead and find it in module two um, as you're working. Okay. that this little exercise that we just did, um, first of all, I'm going to say that if you, if you remember from reading module two, there's some notes in the I module, this is not something that you know, you're going to have to um, internalize every last bit of it. But essentially, you can measure energy requirements, and you can predict them or calculate them, right? And we're going to get into um, estimating requirements for MD in a moment. And when you, um, basically what we've adopted, so in the old days, we used to use the Harris-Benedict equation. It is, it, in this module, I explain how it's really, the, the evidence isn't supporting Harris-Benedict. It was a very small data set that we had this derived from. Um, there are some new, new workups of that data and, and other things, but when I, I, I'm not going to take us there. Mifflin St. Jor is kind of the equation that I'm going to have us think about using to estimate basal, or not basal, it's really resting metabolic rate. That's kind of the amount of energy you need to just be at rest, right? And it's more often than not, and it's still only about 70% accurate. Okay, these, these equations are always, you know, humans are on a bell curve, right? So it's never perfect, but we're going to use the Mifflin as sort of normal, healthy, if you were healthy, um, not sick, if we calculated Mifflin, 70% of the time we're going to get a pretty good estimate of resting metabolic rate. And if you, and, you know, and most of you in this room who are active and doing stuff, you know, then we have to do, we have to apply an activity factor or whatever. So to get to total energy expenditure, right? In our hospital patient population, we don't do indirect calorimetry, except in the ICU, pretty much. I mean, most teaching hospitals in America have um, many, I should say, have indirect calorimetry carts. These are carts that, you know, you breathe through a mask or you have a big bubble canopy over you, and we measure resting metabolic rate. In a sick person, all we need is to measure resting metabolic rate because that's all they're doing. They're in the hospital, right? Resting then would be total energy. For anybody else, ambulatory, um, you know, we would apply a factor, an activity factor, or maybe you know, a stress factor. Um, there are some other things you can see in this module. And we're going to practice it. It's easier to practice than it is to really talk a lot about it up front. Now, what you guys just did, comparing what is the actual measured resting metabolic rate compared to the estimated or calculated one is sort of telling us in MNT world, okay, so this is another example of something that you're not going to likely use. Um, it's, a, it's a teaching tool. That if somebody is hypermetabolic and, you know, um, we've got an indirect calorimetry measurement and they are, um, they've just undergone a trauma or something like that, if we compare actual measure to their calculated when they're normal and healthy in Mifflin, we're going to see hypermetabolism, right? I'm going to tell you we're going to talk about metabolism and, and metabolic stress. In this case, we got MB, right? You guys decided that she was malnourished, right? If you remember way back when, not that long ago. Um, so it's not surprising, I don't know if it surprised anyone, that she's hypermetabolic. So your metabolism kind of drops if you're not eating super well, right? And not always, right? So if you've got inflammation and some other things going on, uh, that's going to counter that. 
But that's what we're going to get to later today um, after we um, probably need to take a break. But so are there questions about this and, the, and doing this ratio? Um, again, this is an MMT world way for us to sort of look at measure, look at calculated, using that to, to kind of evaluate metabolic status for our casework. Okay, and I won't have you do it on every case, but yeah. Did you have a question? Yeah. Oh, your card is. Um, I forgot about that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'm Jenna, and um, so you're saying if you have like a ratio less than one, that means they're high or high. I want you to look in module two because there's a slide. And oh no, it's right here. This is module two, right up at the top here. Okay, Perfect. that's how you interpret it. Okay. And that means there's this normal range, right? Give or take 10%, typically, you know, we call that normal. It's arbitrary. So hypermetabolism, if it was above, you know, 10% above and higher. Um, all right, and I'll give you an example of somebody with acute respiratory failure or whatever. Are there any questions about this and how you would, you know, I can't remember if we asked him to do this. I don't think we did. <laughs> But we might on case two. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. By the way, I hope you guys saw that we posted case one. Um, it is posted as of not that long, so I just didn't get a chance to, to uh, post an announcement. We did that yesterday, I think. Right. So, so you know case one is out. Yeah. 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 You know case one is now, it is available for you to work on, and what we're doing today is going to help us a little bit with that. Um, so if there are no questions about that, let's take a break and come back at 35, if that's okay, and we'll continue working MB. And those that are, you know, if you, well, we'll just take a break and, and come back in five, please. Critical illness and injury. Sorry, I can't talk. And, and um, hey, Katie, is that working? Oh yeah. Okay, good. So, critical illness and injury, part one. And if you can pull those out, this will help us together um, for us. Everybody with me? All right, so there are two parts to this. The first one we may mostly focuses on the metabolic stress response. So I've been talking about, um, I've been alluding to it, so I want to really have us think about what are the conditions that can precipitate a, a response that we would call metabolic stress response of, and, and um, what are the key characteristics, the phases of it, what's happening to those, those uh, proteins we talked about, the negative and positive acute phase proteins, and um, uh, various other things that are defined in the set of notes. This is a long set of objectives, so I think it will be um, fairly clear as we go through. So let's just talk about what are the things that will elicit a metabolic stress response. So sometimes I'll um, you know, make a really lame joke that you know exams are not a precipitating factor for metabolic stress. Okay, you do feel stress, but that's a different kind of stress, right? So um, major injury, trauma, um, falling off a roof, you know, major surgery, burn injury big fractures, long bone fractures, hip fractures, sepsis, we're going to talk about all these things, and acute pancreatitis. Through, through the semester, we're going to get to these in turn. Um, we'll talk about burns and some of the other things uh, when we get to critical illness part two. Um, this is busy, and I think I put it in an enlarged slide for you at the end of the notes, I hope. If I didn't, I need to make sure I do. At the very end, Possibly, no, is that no? Ugh, okay, I will. Katie, please remind me to do that. I don't know why I didn't do that. 
Nobody is finding that elsewhere? Okay, sorry about that. Maybe I, maybe I post, I did it in my complete slides, so I give you the big, I'll give you the big slides so you can see them as well. So this is a little bit busy, all right? So let's just talk through what happens when you have a major wound or a major burn, okay? So this is not a cut finger, right? <laughs> major, big deal. Um, and I'm not ever sure totally where to start, okay? Let's just think of all of these three things could happen uh, depending on the, the degree or the type of injury. If it's a burn, think about, let's, let's start with talking about a burn because all four of these are, are, are um, relevant to a major burn injury. You get a breakdown of the skin, right? If you think about a burn, it's gonna be, you know, it'll, it could be the lungs or some other uh, part, but typically we're talking about burn uh, to the skin. With that loss of the skin barrier, you get phagocytic release of mediators. Phagocytosis is um, implying immune cells, right? The cells that are first in line to the scene of, a, of, a, of an injury, um, neutrophils and, and, and uh, other white blood cells that will release mediators that are basically sounding the alarm, right? They're calling, um, using cytokines to call other cells to the site of injury. So that's what that's about. If you've got a burn injury or a massive wound, you're gonna evaporate, you're gonna lose fluid through that wound, right? So that's evaporative fluid um, loss. That it particularly is true of a burn injury, you get heat loss, right? Big, but it, if you've got a big other type of wound, that also can lead to, to heat loss. Any, any break in the skin you know, that, that is a, a large wound is gonna cause that. Rapid loss of fluid and electrolytes. That leads to hypovolemia, right? Blood pressure, blood volume drops because you, you're losing blood, you're losing fluid and electrolytes. Um, hemorrhage, uh, bleeding to death, uh, uh, or you know, massive bleeding also contributes to hypovolemia. When you have that problem uh, of of um, you know, when you've got a hemorrhage, and then that would be, again, for many major injury, vasoactive peptides get released. And a large part of that is, um, we'll, we'll get a little bit more into detail on that, but that's part of um, the, I'm just thinking about where I wanna, let me, let me just look, scan for a second to make sure I don't say it in the wrong spot here. That's part of the, uh, Remember how we talked about why albumin, uh, that albumin drops in someone who is metabolically stressed or a person who's responding to a major injury? And I talked about there are four mechanisms that drive hypoalbuminemia when you've got that problem, when, you, when you've, you've had a major injury. Does anyone, do we want to take a moment and, and remind ourselves what those four mechanisms are? or just make a note to yourself that I want you to go back and learn those. What are the four? Um, let's, take a, let's take a minute, and Katie, I'm gonna ask you to help me with this, okay? I want you to, for a minute, I want you to jot down what you remember about what are the four major mechanisms that drive hypoalbuminemia in a person who's got critical illness response to you know, metabolic stress that's in response to a critical injury. We talked about it in, um, the first part of the biochemical notes, okay? And I want you to write for one minute at yourself, just by yourself, and then I'm gonna call this back together for you to turn to your partner and, and share. So two, two. <laughs> so don't talk yet, get your thoughts together. On the exam, okay, so we're, we're starting to review to the exam.
So now you've got your thoughts together. Turn to a partner at the table and just talk to each other, pair up, and share your thoughts about this. Make sure you, go, you guys have the same four mechanisms. And whoever is ready, willing, and able to share, put your hand up. So remember what I've asked you is the four mechanisms that are driving hypoalbuminemia um, in critical illness or metabolic stress response, right? Anybody have a hand up ready to start us off? primary mechanisms, the really three big ones, and the fourth was one that often happens, but it's not, you know. Anybody find it and want to talk about it? Come on, please. Thank you. And tell us your name if you don't mind. All right, so I'm Mary, and I found the four causes here. It's decreased synthesis, um, increased degradation, shift of distribution from intra to extravascular space, and inadequate protein intake. Awesome. Okay. Can you, Mary, can you read the third one if you found it in the slide? Could you read the rest of it after you said shift in distribution from intravascular to extravascular space? Read the rest of that, will you? So, um, shift in distribution of albumin from intravascular to extravascular space with increased microvascular permea permeability that accompanies inflammation and the acute phase response to injury or illness. Awesome. Thank you so much. That shift, okay, so, so that's where we're at, right? We're thinking about the negative acute phase protein, albumin. Synthesis goes down, degradation goes up. This point over here, up here, up this, you know, vasoactive peptides being released. What that means is you get increased permeability of the blood vessels that allows for albumin to move out into the interstitial space from blood, right? And that's why that's one of the, it's a side effect really though, right? It's not, it's not the goal necessarily for your body to move albumin out. It's, what, it's basically to allow phagocytic types of cells, those immune cells, the neutrophils that come in and blast invading organisms with hydrogen peroxide, the white blood cells, and other, other cells that need to get into the system. Inflammation is about that, right? And so it's driving, that's what inflammation really is, is getting all hands on deck, allowing them to move into the tissue. And to do that, you need vasoactive amines to help us get permeability, more permeability of the blood vessels. That's a simplistic way to think about it, but that's part of what we're talking about with inflammation. Do you have a question? Yeah. yeah. Wait, use your, use your mic and Rebecca, right? Yes, it's Rebecca. So the, the primary reason is so the phagocytes can get in the cell, but the secondary thing is that the albumin feeds out of the, yep. not the cell, um, the, the blood vessels. Yeah. Yep, yeah. That's my take on it. I mean, okay. for our purposes, it's a reasonable thing to think about. The synthesis, decrease, decrease synthesis and increased degradation of albumin under these conditions. What did I say? Why was that? What, what's the point of that? Why would your body make less albumin and degrade it? What's the purpose of that while we're in this kind of 
mounting a response to a major injury. Kara? If I remember correctly, it's because it's producing the plasma. Mm -hmm. So what are we doing with the albumin? Breaking it up, right? What are we, what are we getting from it to do that? Anybody? Simple enough, it's not a, it's not a cheap. Yeah, Andy, right? Can you use your mic? Oh, maybe you don't have one. I could give you one. <laughs> Andy, amino acids? Yeah, so we're freeing up amino acids to use for the synthesis of those positive acute. So you're totally right, right? We're building positive acute phase reactant proteins from the amino acids that come from albumin and other negative acute phase. Cole? Um, so I just had a question. So yeah. like on this flow chart, where would you find you know, like your, your CRPs and IL-6? It's not going to be in this flow chart per se. All of the, the so on the next few yeah, slides. The arrows. Huh, pardon? Are they just like the arrows? They're not, they're part of it, they're not. Um, it's a culm, so CRP is one of the um, positive acute phase reactant proteins. It's not really represented on this slide. I'm just going to say it's a complex. Well, it is down here, right here. Good question. There it is. Sorry, I'm over here. <laughs> I'm hopefully not going to hit Emily in the eye with my, um, my laser. Um, increased hepatic synthesis of acute phase proteins. That's where CRP shows up on this. Yeah, this is, it's kind of a roadmap. It's not perfect, but it's, it's a way for us to start talking about it. Um, now, the other thing that is really critical that we're going to talk about in a moment is this hypovolemia. This is a big problem in response to injury. Um, and I'll, I'll, maybe I'll ask it now. Is there any, are there any, um, what are they called? The, um, you know, uh, guys that run around the emergency squad, um, medics, paramedics. <laughs> like, what is the word? What is the word? Are there any paramedics in the room? That, that's sort of a funny, um, I don't need one. I'm good. Um, <laughs> You're an EMT. You're an EMT. EMT, that's the thing, right? So what, what, when would, um, would you expect to see after somebody had a major injury, um, do you think about basic, even basic first aid training, what's the first priority you feel like you have if you've got someone who's had a major injury, you're, you're, you, what, like from a medical standpoint, what's the first thing that you might do or first or second thing, um, and, and, and anyone in the room has had first aid, I don't mean to put you on the spot. You look at their airway and make sure they're breathing. Okay, right. So you want to make sure they're breathing. Um, what might you do from a medical intervention point of view? Um, and I'm just going to tell you, or I'm going to ask you, do you hang, do you give IV fluids? No. You don't. So you're not in the... That's the, a paramedic. That's a paramedic. Okay, thank you. That's useful. Okay. When you're talking about basic first aid, though, we talk about some of the response to an injury, heat loss, right? You put a blanket over somebody, right? You worry about shock, right? Shock is related to hypovolemia. I'm pointing over here. Tell me your name, by the way, please. Courtney. Courtney, thank you. Um, so hypovolemia is one of the major things that is, is the most life-threatening thing. It's, and we're going to talk about the phases of the, the stress response. But somebody's volume drops. Um, that's it's something that we're going to be really very concerned about. Why? Because you get decreased perfusion of organs, including the heart, the kidneys, right? Um, everything shuts down when you're hypovolemic. So the first thing we're going to do to treat someone is we're going to give them fluids. We call it fluid resuscitation. The other thing that happens is they are anoxic because you're not able to actually deliver the blood to the, the organs, the heart, right, the lungs, the tissues. So we're in anaerobic metabolism, and guess what? This is where biochemistry and metabolism come together with MMT, right? Have you learned about glycolysis? Okay. What's the end product of glycolysis? Lactate, did you say that? Yes. Lactate, right, lactic acid, okay. It's gonna be one of the biochemical signs of early response to injury. Accumulation of lactic acid. Um, what else do I want to say? The other thing that is very characteristic and critical to the process are all of these stress hormones, these what we call them counter-regulatory hormones, um, because they run counter to insulin. 
you you got insulin and glucagon probably you've thought about, right? I know that shows up in the packages. I'm not sure how much stress hormones get discussed by Dr. Chen. Does she talk about catecholamines and cortisol and that kind of thing? Probably. Okay, well, here we are. So we're going to talk about the counter-regulatory hormones that drive massive mobilization of nutrients and substrate, massive mobilization of uh, skeletal muscle amino acids, fatty acids from, the, from the adipose, right? Like all hands on deck, right? You're thinking about it? We want to make sure we have lots and lots of energy and we need the building blocks available. The other thing is we get sodium retention. We're trying to hold on to fluid. Sodium and fluid retention is common, right? Because we're hypovolemic, we want to bring the blood volume up, bring the blood pressure up, make the heart beat so that we're not going to die, okay? Early stage injury, uh, very critical moments. Um, and mobilization from muscle, a lot of what gets released, we've got branch chain amino acids and, and metabolism. I get to teach you about more about amino acid metabolism, so we'll talk more about that, okay? Um, but we're using them. We're going to use them to make the proteins that we need. And any questions about this? And actually, I'm, I'm going to say, let's hold them, because I want to go into it a little more detailed. And then this is kind of a roadmap for you to kind of help you sort of think about it, however you best learn this sort of information. So inflammation, right? What is inflammation? Um, and this is why I put the slides up, because these uh, I'm going to post the complete slide so you can read these, because if you're on a three per page, you probably can't read this. I had trouble. Well, I don't know if you've got exceptional vision, but um, so it talks you through this. Tissue damage causes relief of, release of vasoactive and chemotactic factors that trigger a local increase in blood flow and capillary permeability, right? Um, permeable capillaries allow an influx of fluid, exudate, and cells, right? Phagocyte, phagocytes and antibacterial exudate destroy bacteria. Phagocytes migrate to the site of inflammation. That's called chemotaxis when you get signals to, to bring them in. So we've got neutrophils and other white blood cells that we just generally call phagocytes. They're the little Pac-Man that eat the you know, debris and other things that are invading. So inflammation, right? It's a, that's, oh, I've got it in easier. <laughs> So you, maybe you do read, the, you can read this on your three per page because I did replace that. Um, okay. And complement and C-reactive protein are released in a massive way by those phagocytes. Um, can you all follow that? I think you, I just basically said that, so I'm going to let that, let that um, go. And this is sort of another way of, I just liked these diagrams. I thought they were pretty good. So um, the idea of Heat, redness, tenderness, right? Inflammation. When you think about it, um, what you know, it's easy for us to talk about inflammation and not really know what we're talking about, right? So this is what we're talking about. Um, it's a it's a cellular and immune um, reaction. It tends to be systemic, especially when you have a massive, big injury. This is a, a systemic response where you are um, you've got. Fever, so increased body temperature as a result of all of these processes, right? And it's also, incidentally, going to increase our energy expenditure. Our energy needs are going to be increased because of the sequelae of events. Michelle? Don't you don't have that slide. That's probably, um, um, I don't know why I didn't do that. I probably was thinking that it was a repeat of what was on this slide. You do have this slide, right? I'm going to post my complete slide so you've got, got it all, okay? It just repeats it. It's similar information. I just, again, I kind of found these and I thought, oh, okay. um, it is copyrighted, by the way, so I am violating that. That's maybe why I didn't give it to you. <laughs> I am realizing that now. It says McGraw Hill up there. But it is password protected. I think I have protection because of that. Um, don't pass them along to other people, right? <laughs> um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about, okay, precipitating events. We got an idea of that from the first slide that I was talking about. Um, traumatic injury, sepsis, major surgery, burns, gunshot wounds, you name it, falling off of, of a roof, being hit by a car, horrible things like that. Um, there are two main phases, the ebb and the flow phase. And the flow phase has a couple of stages, okay? Um, so 
I want to just talk first about the ebb phase. This is where um, Courtney, right, we're talking about being an EMT or a medic, right, no, a paramedic, right? Paramedics are really going to be the ones that are going to um, work with you as the EMT. You're going to come be part, maybe first on the scene, the paramedics will arrive, and then they'll do some of the things that we, we talk about to resuscitate people. So the first thing that, um, they, or, or one of the main characteristics of the ebb phase is hypovolemic shock, okay? That means that you are basically shutting down, okay? That's your first, your body's first response to a massive injury is to shut down and conserve. You're trying to survive, right? This is survival um, and it's imperative that you get medical treatment really early or you may not make it out of this ebb phase. So we get tissue hypoxia, de which is caused by decreased tissue perfusion and backing up one step, when we say it more in an orderly way, hypovolemia, right? Because you're losing blood, you're losing fluid and electrolytes, drives decreased tissue perfusion, which means oxygen delivery to the tissues. That, that's down. So you're hypoxic. Well, your decreased oxygen consumption, that accounts for a drop in energy expenditure, actually. We're, you know, we're hunkering down to survive decreased metabolic rate as a result of that decreased oxygen consumption. Blood pressure and body temperature drop. The duration of this typically is 12 to 24 hours and that's with treatment. I mean, if you don't get treatment, you will die. Um, for most, if, if it, depending on the severity of the, um, of the injury, it's not easy to come out of this without medical care. The hormonal milieu, if you will, is we've got increased glucagon to mobilize glucose. You guys have heard about that, right? We all know about glucagon's role in giving us, right, glucose. What's the uh, pathway or the, yeah, the chemical pathway that helps us make glucose from non-carbohydrate sources? Gluconeogenesis, right? And then where else do we what what else where else do we get glucose that glucagon is helping us liberate it from from which it helps us liberate it never mind like grammar's not good that would be using glucose right how do we get glucose where is it coming from what's how's it stored glycogen right so glycogenolysis so we're going to get some mobilization of glucose so that we can have that um, immediate response and use that for energy right at first, we, we're going to see insulin low, or down. It'll, it'll, it, so glucagon is, is much more high. You know, insulin is going to drop. Um, ACTH will get release of epinephrine, catecholamines, and it's characterized by lactic acidosis, and that's all about hypoxia, pretty much, right? so that your metabolism is depending on anaerobic glycolysis, as, as Cole said over there. Um, OK. We're going to make it out of this, uh, hopefully, right? The, 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 the way we get out of this with medical treatment, a lot of it is fluid resuscitation. So we are get, what that means, when I say that, is we, we an IV bag, right? We've got all the medical shows you've ever seen, right? They spike an IV bag and you get fluids. Well, that's really what we do. Um, fluid and electrolytes to help bring blood volume back up. So assuming that's happened, because your EMT and your paramedic have worked together um, and you make it to the hospital <laughs> over time eventually, you will get stabilized. And once you've got restoration of oxygen transport because you've got fluids that have been replenished and uh, electrolytes, then we're going to be in the flow phase. Okay, So the flow phase, the first part of it, the acute response, is massive increase. Depending, actually, I shouldn't say necessarily that it's always massive, okay? Sometimes you can have more moderate injuries that are more moderate in the impact on metabolic rate. But often, if you've got you know, major gunshot wound or major trauma, um, you are very hypermetabolic. Your, your, your energy requirement goes up because your oxygen consumption goes up. Body temp goes up, we get fever as a response of inflammation, all those cytokines that come together and are driving that. 
increase in the heart uh, cardiac output, lots of inflammatory mediators, growth factors, and what I termed those counter-regulatory hormones. All the hormones that run counter to insulin, including glucagon, are called counter-regulatory hormones. And here they are, catecholamines. The catecholamines are epinephrine and norepinephrine, the fight or flight hormones. Um, we've got glucagon, cortisol. Now, so those, those are kind of the main, the, the first three here are what I would term counter-regulatory hormones. There's also some other, there are some other ones, but those are the big ones, right? Cortisol, catecholamines, glucagon. Counter regulatory to insulin. Now we've got we got increased circulating insulin as well at this juncture. Um, we also have aldosterone going up, and that's basically helping us to hold on to fluid and sodium. It's mostly sodium, and when you hold on to sodium, you hold on to fluid, right? Um, next semester we talk more about aldosterone. You've had physiology, so you just have to remember huh, aldosterone. Um, so all of those are going up with the idea of bringing blood volume up. And they also have um, a huge impact, uh, particularly cortisol, the catecholamines, um, and glucagon is driving mobilization of all substrates, right? Like I said, all hands on deck. We want to have as many um, substrates that we can use for energy, that we can use to build new proteins of the emergency squad proteins, those positive acute phase reactant. So when I talk about acute phase reactants, and I said negative and positive, that's what I'm meaning here. We're talking about the acute phase response to, meta to, a, to a major injury, so the acute response of metabolic stress. So negative acute phase reactants means they're down-regulated during this, right? Positive acute phases, they're turned on. We're making them. We are we need them. They're the, the emergency squad proteins, right, to help us respond. So we've got glucose being released. We're making it. We're breaking down glycogen to release it. We're releasing free fatty acids from fat adipose stores. And we are in high net protein catabolism. So when I say catabolism, you know that means breaking down, right? What's the opposite of that process? Anabolism, right? So we are catabolic. So I want you to take one minute again, and I, or maybe we'll even do, well, well, we'll see how long a minute. Katie, can you help me just keep track of a minute here? I want you to write down at yourself, at your, you know, in your own head first, why would insulin be high under these conditions? What's driving it? So take a moment, take one minute, think about it yourself, and then I'll have you pair up and um, talk about it. Good. Okay. Oh, yeah. Good. Good. Mm -hmm. So we'll go back to this one. Okay. Oh. Okay. So that's where oh, no, we're, that's no, what we're on. I think we just have to do that. Yeah. Thank right? you. Sometimes it works that way. <laughs> okay. Because, like, you know, we escaped versus me. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So turn to a partner and just talk about it so that you can <laughs> share why you think insulin is high under these conditions. Well, how would you explain that? And then I want to see your hands. So let's, let's find really 30 seconds that you can take a super long time to do. Unless you have absolutely no idea. Hopefully you do have some idea. Maybe from, from metabolism. So when I told you that Physiology. It really, it really does come together in this class. So, so that's the hint. You need to think about what. Why
So does that make sense to everybody? So this is the major thing that, that students tend to be a little bit confused by. Like why the heck are we hyperinsulinemia of an emic when we've got all these other counter-regulatory hormones also high, right? It doesn't really make sense because you think about under normal physiology, right, they run opposite. So if insulin is high, typically conditions that, that drive insulin being high, glucagon's low and vice versa, right? In this case, everything's high. And it's, in large part, we've got glucose being mobilized, right? I, you look like you have a question, but can you hold it for just a second? Because I may be able to talk a little bit more. Wait. So, let me get on the next slide here. Um, I have to remind myself where I have it. No, I guess, okay. So let me go back. So one of the things that I want you to just think about and write down here, because we're going to, we'll talk, a, I think we talk a little more about it as we go on here. What do you think are, is, what do you think, um, knowing what I've just told you about catabolism predominating, um, you think insulin is having, getting much traction? Is it, is it able to do what it's supposed to do? Which is what? What, 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 what does insulin help you to do I mean, in response to a high glucose in the blood? Lower blood glucose. Do you think it's effective? No. So it's, what we're in is an insulin resistant state. That's what this is. Insulin resistance. When you hear that, okay, there are chronic diseases. What chronic diseases might be associated with insulin resistance that you can think of? Type 2 diabetes, right? So there are a lot of metabolic, uh, you know, a lot of physiologic conditions over life, um, pregnancies and other, actually, that's insulin resistant. There are other, there, so there's normal, there's some normal physiology involved. In this case, we've got insulin resistance because we don't want insulin to be driving metabolism when we're trying to mobilize the emergency squad proteins, right? Um, so it's important that the periphery, when we talk about insulin resistance, that means the <coughs> peripheral tissues, adipose, skeletal muscle, are immune to the, to the action of insulin, essentially. So, so our, our tissues are not listening. <laughs> to that insulin that's circulating. And that's why we call it insulin resistance. Are there any questions about that? It's a, another one that I think sometimes we get a little, like why is it, you know, it doesn't make sense why everything is high. Um, okay, so here I've just got a few more details where we've talked about this before, that we've, we're switching the hepatic protein synthesis from making the negative acute phase because that was the maintenance state when we're in healthy, you know, before injury. And then after injury, suddenly we're making these positive acute phase reactants, right? The whole point of trying to mount that immune response um, or whatever. So here are a few more to give you some other ideas of some. There, there are others even than this, but fibrinogen helps us make clots, right? To clot, to, to, to stop the bleeding. Complement proteins, basic immune reaction. Um, it's not specific, but it's a very important first line defense. Kind of the pawns on the chest field, I don't know, whatever you want to think of. Complement proteins. Immunoglobulins, um, if you think about immunoglobulins, is that, um, does that ring a bell to anyone? Um, 
heard of the other term for Indian globulins? It's hard to say fast, actually. I'm going to say it again because I'm probably something. Antibodies? In, in a way that's, it's, so it's a cellular response to something. Um, we'll start making those C-reactive protein, which is just, a, again, it's kind of the, the wild alarm uh, bell for all the, the cells to kind of react to. The cytokine, there's a particular cytokine, which is, a, again, a mediator that gets produced by those white blood cells, basic white blood cells. Um, IL-1, interleukin-1. Um, did you spell it? <laughs> Inter, I-N-T-E-R-L-E-U-K-I-N, and it might be abbreviated IL, cap IL-1 drives this switch. So again, everything has a reason and there's a mechanism. Um, and there are lots of cytokines and it's a very coordinated response and I'm only giving you just a little bit of this, but um, the cytokine that primarily drives it, we'll say is interleukin-1. I-N-T-E-R, that's okay, and then an L-E-U-K-I-N, perfect, thank you. Um, now, the magnitude of response, this, this catabolic and, you know, inflammatory response is going to be related to the degree of injury for the most part. Um, when we talk about burn injury, that's the worst type of injury you can possibly um, experience, and we'll talk more about kind of where that ceiling is, um, but just know that. This acute response typically is t seven to 10 days. So it's, it's usually, you know, just a week or so. Um, of course, you're getting medical care. You've, you've you know, you're, you're um, being treated and, and hopefully uh, it starts to ease after that first week, ideally. And then you move into an adaptive response and that is sort of a signal that we begin to recover, okay? And now burn injury is a different animal. We'll talk a lot about burn injury later. Um, but just assuming, you know, you've had an injury, you've undergone surgery or whatever, your hormonal response, those counter-regulatory hormones will start to drop. Um, your metabolic rate begins to return to normal. And when we say if you're in the, ad the adaptive phase, anabolism is predominating. So insulin starts to take some traction, get some traction and actually be more effective. Um, and it's this stage that you are, you know, your potential for really benefiting a lot by giving good protein, nitrogen, um, you know, with our nutrition support regimens that we're going to talk about after we get past critical illness, we're going to talk about um, nutrition support, enteral and parenteral feeding. So let's talk about when things go very, very wrong. They can go um, very wrong. And when we're talking about ICU um, and a lot of different potential conditions can lead us down this, this uh, track, if you will, where we might experience this kind of a, uh, these sequelae over here. So let's just talk about them so you know what they are. Um, when you're in an ICU rotation in your internship, you will, exp you will um, un invariably get exposed to this uh, term, terminology, systemic inflammatory response syndrome, SIRS. And um, it's not entirely clear why SIRS happens, but essentially um, it's, it's when the inflammatory response just goes out of control. It, it is, um, and, and there are some, some things that are, tend to go along with this, but we'll just say massive inflammatory response, just over, um, reaction in, 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 in ways, right, that can occur with a major insult. Um, and often it's, it's kind of a multiple insult kind of situation where you have the first injury, then you get an infection, right, and we're going to talk about sepsis, which is an infection of the, in the blood, right, that might be the second insult, then you end up with this um, sequelae of events. And you know, all of your immune cells are reacting. You've got massive release of cytokines and those mediating um, factors that, that drive catabolism, and it increases oxidative stress and that exacerbates it. Um, you get activation, again, of, the, of that complement cascade that's kind of your basic response to an infection or a, or a major injury. Um, 
there are ways to diagnose it. it, diagnose it, it it's either a drop in body temp or it could be an elevated temperature, right? So below normal or above normal temperature is one, one sign. Um, increased heart rate, increased respiratory rate. I'm not going to ask you these things, but if you want to jot them down, you can. Um, white blood cell count really high, right? Showing that you've got infection. Um, and there's some other signs. So there, there are ways for, for us to um, diagnose it, right? And it's not us that does that, right? That's the, the physician that's involved is going to diagnose whether SIRS has happened. But it's essentially metabolic stress out of control. When you have um, SIRS and an identifiable organism in the blood stream, if you can imagine that, so that's why we have all these, these protections in place, right? We're not supposed to have bacteria in the bloodstream. It's, it's not normal when we have it and they are uh, allowed to grow out of control or you know, they, they take hold. Uh, we call that sepsis and it's the sign, you've got signs of SIRS plus an identifiable bacteria or organism that's in the blood. Further down the track, when, you, when we say it's severe sepsis, it is associated with multiple um, organ dysfunction syndrome and septic shock, and, and septic shock is you've got a dry, the blood pressure just cannot, we can't get it up with fluids, we're giving pressors, we're trying our, our best to help someone, help your blood pressure come up, um, and, and that is a, a really serious problem when, when you have it, okay? These are the most complex uh, patients that you will deal with as a dietitian in the ICU, and they're really complicated, right? So they have high needs, really, because they're, meta they're hypermetabolic, but they've got all of those hormones that are continually driving more catabolism. Very difficult to, to give them a lot of nutrients. You have to be really careful not to overfeed, even though they're hypermetabolic. So they are catabolic. We're trying to optimize protein, they might get organ uh, failure, right? As a result of this septic shock, um, drop in blood pressure, um, and, and it typically, the organs will fail in this order, okay? So at the lungs, you'll get respiratory failure, they'll be on a vent, a ventilator. Um, there's a thing called acute respiratory distress syndrome, massive inflammation associated with respiratory failure. Um, the liver can fail. You'll see cholestatic jaundice with that failure. The GI tract will shut down and we'll have what we call ileus. And um, I talk about this again in the next set of notes, but I'll just, for now, I'll just say ileus means you're stopping peristalsis. That GI tract is not moving anything, okay, ileus. You can also get stress ulcers because you get massive, so remember the, the, the diagram where I said vasoactive amines or vasoactive um, substances? The big one that I didn't mention there, I should have, is histamine. Histamine um, is one of the vasoactive substances that we release in response to stress, right? It's driving that permeability that we talked about. Well, histamine, if you remember, at the stomach drives acid release. I don't know if that's something we maybe learned about, but just know that it's, it's, it drives acid release. It's why we do H2 blockers, right? For people that have excess acid, we block histamine release at the stomach that reduces acid production. That's a, that's a side, okay? <laughs> but, right? So histamine is driving stress ulcers and burn injury. Um, we'll talk again about that. It's, it's not uncommon to see people develop ulcers as a result of that massive histamine release. Um, but it happens here as well. It can happen here. And then the kidneys. Um, acute oliguric, not making much urine is what oliguria means, renal failure. So these are the sequelae of things that can happen. You know, there's a, you know, there, it's sort of a, it's a Venn diagram, so there are lots of overlapping uh, forces at play, and, and a lot of these conditions, um, trauma, burns, acute pancreatitis, are the ones that we tend to see in the ICU with this kind of sequelae, okay, with sepsis and SIRS and all that. So, any questions about that before I talk about nutrition support? And I know we're getting short um, a break, but we'll keep on it. Maybe you'll think of ones over the break. Um, 
So let's talk about what do we do? Um, so I, m I mentioned a moment ago, right? People are hypermetabolic, they are catabolic. Why can't we just feed them and keep them from catabolizing, right? We know, um, and I'm gonna talk about this at the end of the semester, but I might as well say it here. A one week stay in the ICU, less than half the, the people that experience a, even a, just a short one week ICU stay are back at work a year later. It's a massive loss of muscle and strength, uh, muscle mass, and it's a huge hit to your functional status to have an ICU stay. So our goal is to provide plenty of protein, but don't overfeed calories, okay? And, and that is typically what we're gonna um, see and at some point, and I'm not sure when we'll do it, I wanna pull out the Aspen critical care guidelines, but I'm, I'm not gonna have us think about that too much at the moment. Um, that will help us with the evidence behind that. Why do we um, try to, to do that? We're monitoring electrolytes. Fluid and electrolyte balance is enormously difficult to challenge. And then there's this notion and lots of evidence to say that if we feed somebody pretty early after they've undergone massive injury like this, we can attenuate, that means dampen down the metabolic stress sequelae, the, the, we, can, we can modify it a bit. We're not gonna be able to stop the catabolism, but by feeding early, we can keep the gut working and we can, we can do some things that will help mitigate um, this, the, the response, okay? And there's some good studies on that. Now, early, but not too early, right? What does that mean? Um, so typically we define early feeding as within, um, 24 to 48 hours after an initial injury, and, and this is a very important and, after they're fluid resuscitated. So you want to make sure that somebody's got plenty of good volume distributed. You want to fluid resuscitate them. They are, they've got normal cardiac output. Their blood pressure is stable, pretty much. And it can be that they're getting some medications to help them with that, but they have to be stable and then we can feed them. We don't wanna feed them when they're not stable. They haven't um, undergone uh, fluid resuscitation. Um, and the reason for that, just I'll just say it right here, I think I say it again, we talk about it in enteral as well, is that you can cause gut ischemia. If you feed, especially if you feed a tube feed, you give somebody enteral feeds into a GI tract that is inadequately um, oxygenated and perfused, right? The blood is not adequately flowing to the GI tract. You'll cause the gut to potentially die when it's a necrotic um, impact, right? So we want to make sure that we are, the person is adequately fluid resuscitated, their blood pressure is good, or managed on pressors before we feed. And when we get to the Aspen guidelines, that gets described and discussed a little bit better. And in the Can We Feed article that you read, actually, right? I forgot you guys read that for today. It talks about that. So, um, and I am gonna, I'm gonna, ooh, going to, I've gotta give you a break, don't I? Let me just see where we can stop here. Let, can we just talk about early feeding? Has a lot of benefits. So I've defined it within 24 to 48 hours after injury or major surgery. Patient's high hemodynamically stable. We're gonna say that's when, when we can feed. Has a huge um, impact on reducing the hypermetabolic response to stress. It keeps the gut working to feed enterally, right? We wanna, we, we minimizes the atrophy of the villi that can happen if you don't feed somebody. So if you leave them not, um, not being fed, that's a major problem. This bacterial translocation, this is mostly shown in animal models. It's not easy to show it in humans, but it's thought that there can be, um, by, by helping to maintain the GI tract integrity, which is what this is up here, minimizing atrophy of the gut, that you are basically protecting that immune barrier that is the gut. The gut has an enormous importance in just kind of um, you know, protecting us, right? And so you can, you, by maintaining it, you can prevent sepsis that, that originates from um, bacteria moving between cells of the gut. Uh, less 
fewer incidents or you know uh, decreasing sepsis and the complications associated with that enhancing the immune response and um, cost-effective nutrition support I mean, it's basically min minimizing the complications um, associated with the, the metabolic response to stress before we take a break any questions about this part okay can we take five minutes and come back it is six 29, no 30, just 35 or so, or maybe a minute before 35 if you can help it. Thank you. you to think about um, how do you think critical illness and injury leads to malnutrition if you had to explain that just in a, a, a quick uh, you know rudimentary way um, you know somebody who's healthy you know really up to the moment that they have their accident they come into the ICU we think about that I'm just going to say this acute disease or injury um, associated malnutrition category is a tricky one, right? Because it may be that they, they, they don't have a lot of the criteria maybe right off the bat um, to diagnose them, but they're certainly at risk, right? Is that, so what would you say if someone said, why, why am I at risk for malnutrition given that I'm in the ICU? What would you say to that person? Yeah, Cole. Yeah, so um, because of the metabolic stress, you might undergo like protein catabolism. So you're losing body weight and you could, I mean, you're not moving necessarily. You might be on, you know, feeding, but your body's just using more energy and an easy way to become elder. Yeah, fantastic. And in lay terms, you might say you're breaking down your muscle stores, your protein. You're breaking down protein, right? You're going to waste, you're going to lose strength. Um, so some of the, th we'll, we'll talk about a case next week that will help us, I think, think a little bit more about that. So the final part of this, and I'm going to skip a lot through these slides, okay, because I've kind of fleshed them out. It's sort of a way, I think it's helpful, it's been helpful for students in the past, to just think about kind of comparing and contrasting simple starvation with metabolic stress and, if you will, acute disease uh, driven malnutrition, which is kind of on that turquoise side of things. I mean, metabolic stress is putting someone at risk for acute disease related malnutrition, right? So the metabolic events that are happening are absolutely opposite to each other, pretty much, okay? And it's helpful, I think, because, well, you do get some of this, I think, with Dr. Chen. Um, and I don't know if you've done it yet. You probably haven't done big picture, maybe, things, pulling it together. No, probably not. Have you heard about simple starvation, what happens from simple starvation? Okay. You, I think she does get to it later. Um, we'll do, do a little tag teaming this semester. So simple starvation, I'm going to talk a little about that, and then we'll, we'll, we'll compare and contrast. So starvation. Characterized by low insulin to glucagon ratio, meaning insulin's low, glucagon's high, right? That's typical of starvation. Um, over time, we adapt. We're marvelous at adapting to inadequate intake over a long period of time. So people you know you can live for several months if you've got decent stores on board um, to starvation or a semi-starvation state. One of the ways that your body can do that, can last that long, you know, again, assuming you've got some adipose um, stores, is that the brain adapts to um, using ketone bodies. Have you heard that before? You know from biochem, right? Where, where, where do we make ketone bodies from? 
what, what substrate, macronutrient? We've got fat, protein, and um, how do I was like, what's that one? <laughs> dirty, dirty, dirty. Okay. Um, <laughs> where do we make ketone bodies from? Fat. Write that down. Somebody gets it wrong on every exam, every year, that it does not come from carbohydrate. Okay? Ketone bodies come from fat metabolism. All right. I'm going to tell you that your brain, under normal circumstances, is, a, is, a, it is an obligate, meaning it needs glucose. Right? So the normal condition is your brain is needing glucose. And you know, you've got kind of a minimum you know, requirement, but I won't go into that. Um, when you start to adapt to starvation, your brain begins to be able to use about half of its energy, actually, can, can begin to come from ketone bodies. Now, if you think about what's happening, if you're not, let's take the easiest case that we're not con consuming anything, okay? Nothing coming in, right? High glucagon is going to be driving, so your brain needs glucose, right? So you're getting it from what? What's, what's the process that, that you're getting the glucose from? I mean, initially, right, an initial fast, when you go into a fast, where do you get glucose from? Glycogen, right? How long, roughly, do you have any idea of how long that lasts for you? A day or so, give or take, right? So the glycogen stores are great, but, you know, they kind of they go away after a while, right? A day or so, glycogen's only used up. Then what? Where's gluconeogenesis? Where are you making glucose from in that early response? Where do you get, where do you, okay, glucone, you guys have done gluconeogenesis or are you in the process of it in metabolism? You had it in biochem though, right? Everybody had biochem? No, what did we make glucose from? in the early stage of, a, of, of this starvation state. Nothing, no carbs coming in. Where are we, what are we making, what are we using to make glucose? Sorry? And what is the most important source? Amino acids, right? We're breaking down our muscles, right? Now, if we continue doing that, we would be dead in about two weeks or a week or whatever. Yeah, really. <laughs> Sorry, I got loud. I get loud, I scare you me. Right? So it's critical that our, and, and, and so that glucose is really important to feed the brain. Well, over time, we start, the brain adapts to using ketone bodies. So did I just explain how that spares protein? Does that make sense to you? Your brain, is, through this adaptation response, starts to use less glucose. So guess what? We break down less protein to use to make glucose. And that's a huge benefit to allow us to, to last longer in a, in a long um, fast. Now, the other thing that happens in, a, in an adaptive response to simple starvation is we make less thyroxin. Thyroxin drives energy expenditure. So we see a drop in resting energy expenditure. I, I, using, um, and, I, and I explain this in module two, if you see REE, -E, that's the same thing in my book as resting metabolic rate. It's the same thing. RMR equals REE. -E. It's just I, I interchange them because I forget sometimes to be consistent. Right? So what drives it? Drop in thyroxine. And how does that help to spare protein? How would you say it? Say it louder, will you? Take a mic and whoever. Jenna, like right? you're just using less energy or yeah. performance overall. Yeah, less energy needed, so less protein broken down, less skeletal muscle broken down. And then fat under these conditions is supplying the majority of energy requirements. And we maintain the negative acute phase reactant proteins. We've got a large pool of albumin in that interstitial space. It's huge. We tend to maintain the blood level when we're in simple starvation, keep albumin up so we're not edematous. Not until pretty late in the process of starvation do we, you know, then, then we're in the combination of 
energy, you know, marasmus, squash york, or whatever. Um, the other thing that happens, by the way, is that adipose is being broken down for energy. All tissues that can use fat are burning fat for energy. We can use glycerol for gluconeogenesis. Remember that? The glycerol is, is a very nice carbohydrate, or, or a, not, it's a fat-derived non-carbohydrate source for gluconeogenesis, right? And that's a little diagram, and I think it's pretty self-explanatory. I'm going to put it in big so you can see it if um, you want to look at it later. So I'm going to click now, and I'm actually going to click through this because I have already said a lot of this. So as I click, I'm going to just not talk through it if you don't mind, right? Anything, um, so you see that? Got the counter-regulatory hormones labeled. I've got negative nitrogen balance, by the way. I didn't introduce that before. When you're cut catabolic and you're a net protein loss, we say negative nitrogen balance. Does that make sense? You may come across nitrogen balance. We're not, we don't do it a lot clinically because it's highly erroneous, um, but so how would you think protein catabolism and nitrogen, just protein catabolism compares to simple starvation? Less or more? Come on, guys. Is it going to be lower? In, um, in metabolic stress, is it going to, it's going to be higher, right? I'm not articulating this very well, right? It's much, much, much higher, like 10 times or more higher, way um, can be quite significant. I've got questions in here, and I think I'm, I'm going to skip them. You know what happens to the negative APRs, right? We talked about it before. We also know that REE goes up or RMR goes up. We've talked about the mobilization of substrates. In a lot of ways, this is a bit of a, um, a what do you call it, a review. I mentioned cytokines. I said IL-1 is driving that shift in um, production of the um, starting to make the positive acute phase proteins. The other thing is fever, right, increased body temp that's driven by those cytokines um, and other, other um, factors. I've given you a list of positive acute phase reactants. You know C-reactive protein is our big one that we are going to focus on. IL-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha. These are kind of your top three. There are 20 or more, actually more than that, probably 30. Um, cytokines, right? There are lots of different ones. These are kind of the top three I want you to just be aware of. When we talk about cancer, tumor necrosis factor shows up again because it's driving, you know, these, these, these factors. Um, quickly on this is just a bit of a list, right, that you can see what's happening at each of the major tissues, and we've talked about these. The one thing that I will point out, trace metal sequestration. What that means is your body, your liver, will store and keep from bacteria, iron, copper, you know, these trace metals that bacteria tend to like. I mean, it's kind of, I don't know, I was, it, it, it's thought to be that's why we do this. We kind of hold on to these metals and we keep them stored. Um, ferritin, for example, right, it's going to gonna store your iron. Uh, what else do I want to point out? Just in, um, this right here, skeletal muscle putting out glutamine. When we get to metabolism, and I talk about amino acid metabolism, I'll tie it back to that. You'll, you'll reinforce that, hopefully. I will reinforce that for you. Intestine drops. It normally takes up a lot of glutamine from blood um, and from our diet, right? If, if we're in a metabolic stress type of response, the gut tends to take in less glutamine. And that's what part of that atrophy is about. And it's why if we feed people, we can kind of, we can attenuate that a little bit, okay? And we talk about glutamine and metabolism when I get um, a chance there. And then we've got the hormone changes that, that we've talked about. So take, um, let's see if we can take a moment um, and see if you can fill this out. Well, actually, let's, maybe let's do it this way. Everybody, get, get a way that you can sort of take your own notes on this, okay? And I'm just gonna throw it out there and then I'm gonna, we'll see how fast we can do this in a way that makes sense, okay? So what do you think? Energy requirements, right? That means RMR. Would you put lower and higher, put them in the, the right uh, category? What would you say? Simple starvation, um, how does that compare to metabolic stress? 
And first person to grab a mic. Actually, maybe put a hand up. And I'll <laughs> what, what would you say? Give me a, um, yes, thank you. Um, Maddie, for yeah, simple starvation, our MAR is low and metabolic stress is high. All right, so lower maybe and higher if you were comparing them. Beautiful, great. Um, hormonal milieu, what would you say? What is predominant in simple starvation? What, what is more, um, how would you characterize it or, or what's, what's most... Um, And you can do it as a ratio if you want. Anybody? No? Yeah? Please. Um, I might get it's the lower insulin to glucagon ratio. Yeah, beautiful. And starvation? And then what about for metabolic stress? What would you say? Um, you can do it a simple way if you want. The hormonal milieu increases. There's so and specifically, right, and, and, and you could just say all of the hormones that we talk about, all the ones that we know, and hopefully you'll, you'll be able to write, you know, you bring them to mind, right? Catecholamines, cortisol, glucagon, insulin also are high, right? That's the hormonal milieu is you've got all of the hormones, counter-regulatory and insulin are high, and what's predominating? Not insulin, right? all of those counter-regulatory catabolic hormones are active. What do you think about primary fuel in simple starvation? Is it ketones? No, so the brain is using half of its getting half of its energy from ketones. Where's ketone come? Ketone bodies are made from the metabolism of what we need macronutrient. Fat, right? So fat is really the major fuel. It comes as a result of beta oxidation of fatty acids for energy everywhere. And as we do that, we make ketones as, as um, and you'll learn more about that in, metabolic, in, in metabolism too. But so fat, really primary fuel. Metabolic stress, we'll say mixed. All right, what about protein catabolism? And maybe here, we'll, we, we, I think I'm going to just give it to you because I think it's, it's helpful to just think about, um, we were talking about the energy requirements as well. Um, catabolism for simple starvation over an, an adapted, inadapted starvation, you really lose pretty minimal amounts of, of, of nitrogen when you're really in adapted uh, stage, three to four grams a day, not much. You could be 20, 40 grams of nitrogen going out per day in a catabolic state in a metabolic stress response. And then we know this, so I'm just going to say, right, remember we've talked about ketone synthesis that happens in simple starvation. It may or may not happen in metabolic stress. It depends on what we're doing and how we're feeding somebody and, and other, other, um, other effects. I think I will, um, I'm just looking about this because we kind of talked about this the very first set of notes. We talked about, you know, the, the compare and contrast between these two types um, of malnutrition. I mean, the, these, you've seen these before, I think, where I'm just kind of reiterating a lot of what we just talked about. Um, and, and the idea about time frame, you know, obviously is a big difference, right? Simple starvation takes a long time. Acute illness, we're talking short. Um, you know, the change in anthropometrics, remember that from the first set of um, notes that we talked about. And down here maybe is something to, to pay attention to that I think is a reasonable way to sort of think about these in terms of the response to feeding somebody. So in, in simple starvation, assuming all things are, you know, we're managing everything in the way that there are some complications that can happen like refeeding syndrome or whatever, but putting that aside, when we're targeting goals for somebody who's, who we're treating for simple starvation, we want repletion of energy. We don't need to worry so much about 
repletion level protein because for the most part, it's really energy depletion. Their, their fat stores have been depleted, right? And so we can get them into anabolism with feeding. With metabolic stress and acute disease-related malnutrition, we really want high levels of protein because that's the biggest concern we have. Yes, they are um, increased, um, you know, sometimes very hypermetabolic, but it's mostly the hypermetabolism that we're trying to counter because if we overfeed or we try to give them all the calories they need, that can be very counterproductive. So we tend to say, you know, we're going to go easy on the energy, we're going to really push protein in, in that acute disease um, state. And it's persistent catabolism despite the fact that we're trying to feed people. This is just the way it is. It is not an easy thing. It's, it's even if we could perfectly feed somebody, they're still very likely to be um, catabolic. Are there any questions about anything we talked about? We go back to MB, and you guys can stop. You know, I, I I'm not offended. I've been talking at you way too long, and you're you're got to get up and stretch, and want to get back to talking about MB. So, any questions about any of this? Okay, can we get back? number four? Was is this patient malnourished? We've already answered that, so don't waste any time on that. We said it was starvation-related malnutrition, right? Um, in contrast to you know, metabolic stress, we've talked about simple starvation. She is definitely in that category. What I would like you to do for number five, um, I want you to pull out the nutrition diagnostic codes, because I don't think we've actually, I've, I've not um, brought you to pulling those out. And on the website, I'm going to just um, you've got one in your folder, hard copy, I think, and I don't know what color it is, but it's that chart. I can't find one. Um, <laughs> it is the, the chart of diagnostic codes, right? The Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, the international language, that thing. It's green. Thank you, Kristen. So you have a hard copy. It's also on, in module one, I've placed a number of things, and I'm, there's actually a couple of documents that I want you to use. Um, to evaluate. Uh, but first, what I'd like you to do is think about MB. Can you, so be, beyond malnutrition, right? And, and one thing I would just um, have you look at right now, um, and let me just think about how I can show you this. So, so if you, I'm going to pull something up really quick before we go there, if I can. So in the nutrition diagnosis slides, I added a couple of slides um, just for your uh, reference, and it helps me show you. So look at your diagnostic terminology. The green sheet is also un um, under module one as nutrition diagnostic terminology. Pull up the PDF. And you can see under this category, and you can't see it because it's so small, under the nutrient category is simply malnutrition. And what I, what I put together for you, and I just added this to the diagnosis slides, just so you have it somewhere. I mean, I'm not going to ask you, what is the ICD-10 code for malnutrition? I'm really not going to ask you that, OK? Um, and I'm not going to ask you this, but I do want you to know that this is what we use, OK? So despite the fact that we've got three categories of malnutrition, right, and we decided she's in the um, the simple, uh, the starvation related one. We're going to just use, when, we're, when we um, are writing a PES statement for her, and you guys did it before, um, we're just going to use malnutrition, and that is NI 5.2, nutrient intake 5.2 is, is the code uh, for the academy terminology, okay? So I'd like you, actually, to write two PES statements. You guys have your PES statement from before, and you might, I'm going to have you evaluate what you've done so that you can actually improve it. And I'm going to show you, there's a document in Module 1 that, um, and I'm, I'm a little limited ability to toggle to and, to and fro here. Um, actually, ah, I'm not going to go to it. I'm going to show you. Um, under module one, what did we call it? It is something like evaluate your A dime or something like that. What was that document called? It's just under what is A dime. 
evaluate your A dime or something like that. So that'll help you kind of look at your PES statement and sort of critique it. Um, so you've written one for malnutrition. You can flesh it out by putting the code in. When we do case one, I'm going to want you to put the code in for whatever problem you've identified, whatever diagnosis you have. So I want you to clean up your malnutrition diagnosis, um, potentially, because I'm going to have you look at that, evaluate your PES, and see how good it was, right? And I want you to come up with a second one. So under MB number five, I say, what are two nutrition diagnoses you might choose that would be appropriate to MB, right? So pick another diagnosis and write a PES. That's a number six. And we're going to see how far we get. It's 15 minutes to the class time. So I would like you to, I'm going to try to push you along a little bit. So I'd like you, if you can, to try to do this in about four minutes, five minutes. Write, get the diagnostic codes and write the, get your two PESs. Um, and, you know, you may want to write yourself and then come together as a group. That might be the right way or, or a reasonable way to do it. Or you could get up to the whiteboards and just stretch. Actually, you might want to get up and just get up and so that you're not falling asleep anymore, right? This has been a long class period and it's hard. And you can erase and start writing um, your PES. And you'll have two of them, ideally. 